Good afternoon. I'm Dan Lipkin, head librarian of the Phillips Library at the Peabody Essex Museum. I'd like to begin by respectfully acknowledging that we are on the ancestral territory of the Agawam, Pawtucket, Kennecott, Namkig, Massachusetts, and Wampanoag. Many other indigenous communities have lived and moved through this place over hundreds of generations, and indigenous people from many nations live and work in this region today. Please join us in honoring their communities, their elders past and present, as well as future generations. Thank you. We're very glad that you've chosen to spend some time with us this afternoon. Uh, next slide, please. Looking forward, we have an exciting few months lined up and you'll have plenty of opportunities to connect with Phillips Library and our collections. We're developing more programs like this one and library collections will be very prominently featured in PEM's slate of fall exhibitions, which you see here from the PEM website, including the Salem Witch Trials 1692, Salem Stories in My Dear Davy and Chester, a selection of illustrated correspondence by modern artists in India from the papers of Davida and Chester Hurwitz. And this is the next exhibition in the Phillips Library Collection Gallery. Next slide, please. The library reading room remains open to the public by appointment on Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. For more detail, you can see the library page on PEM.org. The address is there. Or you can get in touch with us by email at research at PEM.org. You can also follow our social media accounts at PEM Library. I'd like to thank some of our community organizations for helping us to promote this event, the Ephemery Society of America, the Ephemera Society UK, American Antiquarian Society, the Grolier Club, the Tickner Society, and our colleagues at PEM, especially Melissa Woods and Megan Wright, for helping, to, uh, helping us to bring this program to life. Many thanks are due to our PEM colleagues, Catherine Robertson, Bethany Beatrice Gravel, and Mark Wood. Everyone is currently muted, but we do encourage questions. Please feel free to type them into the chat box that you see on your screen, and we'll get to as many as we have time for after Hannah's talk. Thanks. Next slide. I am very pleased to introduce our speaker today, who may be familiar to those of you who have visited the Phillips Library over the past two years, or to those of you who keep up with us on social media. Hannah Swan, seen here discussing our ephemera collection with her typical infectious enthusiasm at our Friends of the Phillips Library event back in December, joined the Phillips Library staff as a reference assistant in January 2019. She received her MSc in Book History and Material Culture from the University of Edinburgh in 2018, and alongside her work at PEM, will begin a second master's program in archives and records management at the University College London in the fall. Previously, she was a recipient of a Fulbright teaching grant to, to Tajikistan, lived and worked in Kazakhstan, and more recently worked as a reference librarian closer to home at the Public Library of Brookline. A lifelong ephemerist, Hannah collects ephemera related to party planning, cocktail culture, and gelatin, a collection that won her the David Lang Student Book Collecting Prize at the University of Edinburgh in 2018. She has previously lectured on her work with ephemera at the Northeast Popular Cultural Popular Culture Association's conference last fall, and also had the privilege of attending Rare Book School's Exploring Ephemera Weekend. When not at the library, Hannah enjoys roller skating to classic disco hits and learning new languages. She is a real pleasure to work with, and we are so glad she's willing to share her ephemeral discoveries with us. So, Hannah, please take it away. Oh. Hi everyone, thanks so much, Dan. Um, let me get this sorted. Uh, so, as Dan mentioned, this is Salem for Sale, advertising Essex County 1770 to 1990. I'm Hannah Swan, and I'm a reference assistant at the Phillips Library of the Peabody Essex Museum. Okay. Uh, before we get started, I want to take a moment to thank you all again for attending today and to thank my colleagues who helped make this happen, especially Dan Lipkan and Katherine Robertson. Katherine has been supervising me since this project's inception early last year. As a general roadmap to the presentation, we'll first get into the practical aspects of ephemera, 
What are they? How do we define them? And how can we begin to read ephemera critically? This will help to orient any audience members unfamiliar with ephemera, while also giving those of you who might be old hat a peek into our cataloging practices and policies. The second part of the presentation will be more interpretive, focusing on the stories we can draw from ephemera and why these materials should continue to be collected and preserved on both an institutional and personal level. Two notes before we begin. First, as we go through, you'll notice that this is a highly visual presentation with lots of photos of ephemera and little text. If you would like me to repeat anything, or if you need any clarification, there'll be time at the end to ask questions. Along the same vein, in the interest of time, I haven't included full bibliographic information for much of the ephemera you'll see today. So if there's an ephemeron you want to learn more about, please feel free to ask at the end and I'll be happy to return to it. So with that, let's begin with the biggest question of all, what are ephemera? So the most popular definition comes from Maurice Ricards, who founded the UK Ephemera Society in 1975 and was considered to be one of the preeminent contemporary ephemerists. It's easy to see why Ricard's definition remains the most popular. It's short, punchy, to the point. It's also incredibly broad, but that is, if you'll pardon a pun, by definition. Ephemera are notoriously diverse and hard to define as the word encompasses so many different materials, printed in manuscript, paper goods, and otherwise. If you're still unclear about what that might mean, just think about all the bits of paper you accumulate in your day-to-day -day life. Flyers, receipts, ticket stubs, or theater programs, it's all ephemera. Now on the right here, you'll see our homegrown definition of what we are terming advertising ephemera, the focus of my work and of our presentation today. Advertising ephemera specifically are the printed matter produced by businesses and intended for customers or members of the trade. Some could argue that the term itself is redundant, as all advertising is inherently ephemeral, reliant on trends, fads, and popular culture, and created to be used and then replaced. We can constrain our definition then by a discussion of the major material types. So these are some of the most common material types in our advertising ephemera collection. And I'll just note that material types are often tricky as there's so much overlap and many of these definitions are variable depending on the institution. So first we have trade catalogs. The trade catalog is definitely one of the more ambiguous designations of ephemera. Some institutions define trade catalogs by the inclusion of a price list, while others insist that they have to be multi-page. Broadly, we have defined a trade catalog as a multi-page priced inventory of products or services offered by a company. The classic trade catalog is very similar in both form and function to the mailed catalogs that you might receive in the post today. Um, next, we have letterhead, which is very straightforward. It's business branded stationery. They usually include business information and especially in the 19th century, often included visuals in the header images of manufactories, products, people, sometimes just whimsical imagery. Next, we have another ambiguous material type, circulars. So we define circulars as mailed advertisements, though some define these materials as being circulated in any manner in a population. They can take many forms and there's often overlap with other material types, such as letterhead, trade catalogs, or trade periodicals. Most often, circulars look like personal letters written to the consumer from a company. Salutations such as Dear Sir, Dear Madam, or Dear Mrs. X are usually a good giveaway. Up next is billhead. Billheads or billhead receipts are printed receipt forms headed with businesses information and often including product information, business addresses, and or images of the manufactory or products. Here we have what I'm terming labels and packaging. As the name suggests, these are packages, boxes, tins, cans, wrapping paper, etc., or the labels from packaging. These are often the rarest ephemera as they're the most likely to be discarded by the consumer. Now, one of our best represented material types, broadsides are akin to posters. Printed on only one side, they were intended to be posted or otherwise distributed in a society. 
They often feature bold, eye-catching type and color use, as you see here. Now, this next material type is another fuzzy one. What we have termed trade periodicals are newspapers, journals, or magazines produced by companies either as advertisements to the public for their business or as a way of disseminating information to other businesses in the same industry. Next, we have trade cards. Uh, trade cards are some of the most iconic ephemera, perhaps the most iconic being the chromolithograph trade cards of the Victorian era, like you see here. Uh, trade cards are small, easily portable cards that advertise a business and its products or services. The line between business cards and trade cards is disputed, but usually trade cards are more richly illustrated and feature more information about the goods and services on offer. I especially love this trade card because it's both a piece of ephemera and depicts ephemera. It's very meta. Uh, finally, we have product samples. As the name suggests, they are samples produced by businesses for customers to view or test their products before use. They are more common in certain businesses, such as art supplies and architectural supplies, and were sometimes included inside or alongside trade catalogs. We mostly have paint and fabric samples in the collection, which seems to be fairly typical. And as you'll notice, I'm cheating a little bit here as this is not in Essex County or even the Massachusetts if I'm wrong, but it's actually one of my favorite items in the collection. I just love the little punk rock dog, these pastel pink samples. So now that we've defined ephemera broadly, we can hone in on the collections at the Phillips Library. Before we get into the advertising ephemera collection, it's worth noting that ephemera has historically been one of the biggest collecting strengths of the Phillips Library. Here on the left is an example of the Steamship Ephemera Collection, which may be familiar to those of you who saw PEM's Ocean Liners, Glamour, Speed, and Style exhibition. Selections from the Steamship Ephemera Collection have been digitized and are available on our digital collections website, along with part of our greeting card collection, an example of which you can see here on the right. In the middle, we have a piece from the Essex County Ephemera Collection, not to be confused with the Essex County Advertising Ephemera Collection. This die-cut Buffalo Bill souvenir program isn't entirely representative of the collection. Um, most of it actually looks more like this, uh, equally fun, but maybe less visually pleasing. We also hold a book plate collection, a large broadside collection, and a renowned sailing ship card collection. There are also a lot of ephemera in our print collections, especially late 18th and early 19th century sample books, culinary ephemera, and more business ephemera from Salem. So with that, on to the main event. Uh, the origins of the Essex County Advertising Ephemera Collection are somewhat of an enigma. Although there are some clear contributors, the provenance is diverse and there's almost no documentation regarding the history of this collection. In other words, we don't really know when, why, or by whom it was started. The bulk of the ephemera in the collection dates from the mid 19th to the mid 20th century with particular strength in late 19th century materials. Though the collection actually stretches from the end of the 18th century all the way through to the 1990s. Similarly, the majority of the materials originated in Salem, but the collection actually includes ephemera from about 40 distinct cities and towns in Essex County, Massachusetts. The collection is ranged by business sector from advertising through, the, through to travel, and in total there are about 46 distinct sectors represented. The most notable feature of this collection is its rarity. We estimate that over 90% of the materials are unique to the Phillips Library collections. This can be somewhat misleading, and I'm sure colleagues at other institutions are thinking, you know, I've seen that trade card before, but ultimately it comes down to the local business information that gets included, which ultimately makes the item unique. As is true, I think, of many institutional ephemera collections, these materials languished for a really long time with no way for researchers to access them in any meaningful way. There was no inventory and no catalog record, which is where I come in. So this project began last spring, I think I'm about 18 months in now, when I began to look at processing what was then known as the trade catalog collection. 
the first step was to research other institutions processing as ephemera and to make the choice of speed of processing or depth of research or access. Ultimately, ultimately, we decided that even if it took longer, we would process the collection to the item level so as to center researcher access and the visibility of local materials, something I'll talk more about in upcoming slides. As of now, there's no real standard for how to catalog ephemera. We ended up choosing a hybrid print archival approach to our collection. This means that I created a traditional finding aid alongside a spreadsheet appendix containing full description for each item. For those of you unfamiliar with archival processing, a finding aid is essentially an inventory of a collection that allows researchers to see what each box and folder contains. Ordinarily, collections are processed at a folder level, which makes sense. If we crunch the numbers, say you have a 25 box collection with 10 folders per box and 50 items per folder, Processing at the item level would mean an archivist would have to process 25,000 items individually. So on the left-hand side here, these headers represent the columns of my appendix spreadsheet. As you can see, I took a very granular approach to my item level processing, allowing for the deepest possible researcher access. By preserving information such as the product advertised or the local address, we enable researchers to use search functions to locate individuals or brands much more easily. To date, I have processed 2,683 pieces of Essex County ephemera to the item level using these criteria. So why full processing? Looking more closely, I wanna go through a, a few reasons why it's important to provide such depth of access. So first, as I had previously mentioned, many of the materials in the Essex County Advertising Ephemera Collection were printed by the product's manufacturer with agent or local seller information stamped, printed, or inscribed on the item at a later date. As we can see here with these trade cards from Laird's Bloom of Youth featuring the same national brand sold by two different local shops. And as an aside, Laird's Bloom of Youth is actually somewhat notorious in the history of cosmetics. Though it was meant to whiten and brighten the skin, it was actually a lead-based makeup that ended up giving all these women lead palsy. Pretty nasty stuff. Now, some institutions privilege the manufacturer's information over the local businesses as the copy and illustrations are more indicative of corporate taste. However, especially when looking at these materials in aggregate, an archival privileging of the larger, often national company over the small business makes it difficult for researchers to discover local materials, thus obscuring the regional business landscape. By processing these materials in such a way that centers the local agent, we can relocate the focus of the collection away from corporate history and toward the history of small businesses and local commerce in Essex County. So in my processing, much of this work takes place in the agent or additional author column in my appendix. This began as a way to include both the agent and the manufacturer, but as I went on, I started adding the names of other individuals mentioned in the ephemeron. For those of you familiar with maritime librarianship, I began to think of the column as a kind of ship spoken heading, a term used to indicate sightings of other ships mentioned in a logbook. As you can see here in these ephemera from the A.B. Blaisdell department store, we actually have the names and photos of all the young men, or maybe in Herman's case, young boy, uh, working in the different departments. By including their names in the agent and additional authors column, we enable their descendants to find them and perhaps learn more about their day-to-day -day lives. Ultimately, this helps to destabilize the economic hierarchies that exist in genealogical research, basically archiving so as to equalize the importance of different positions in a company, from the shop boy mentioned in passing to the president or owner perhaps featured on the front cover. So now that I've talked big game about my processing, I'm gonna give you all a look at how I actually think about an ephemeron when it comes across my desk. So this is another one of my favorite items in the collection, though yes, it is possible that I say that about all of them. 
Uh, at first glance, it can seem fairly simple, but there's actually a great deal of information that we can draw from it. So first, a look at the address. Now, this illustration is especially lovely and actually a rare representation of the female gaze in art. From the tools in her hand and her artist's smock, we are to understand that this woman created this statue, lending the whole thing an almost sapphic Pygmalion air. Unfortunately, the illustration ends up being completely tangential to the rest of the ephemeron, but I actually would be interested to know if anyone in the audience recognizes who this woman is meant to be. Uh, ooh, no. Moving along, we already have here a great deal of information just in this small box. First, we have the title of the ephemeron, an attractive proposition, along with the address of the circular, here the Essex Institute, one of our heritage institutions. We also have two stamps, one postal, one ink. The ink stamp, though largely obscured, can be made out to read New York, telling us the provenance of this item. If we zoom in, we can also see an approximate date for the stamp. Uh, this, this stamp is from the 1903 series, meaning this ephemeron could not have been sent before that date. Ultimately, we do have the exact date, 1908, for the ephemeron uh, printed on the insertion. But if these two items had been separated, we still would have been able to approximate the date within five years, which is pretty good, all things considered. Now from the copy, we learn the product advertised, here the twerk ceiling fan, which is interestingly otherwise not referenced in any way on the ephemeron. A quick Google search tells us that the twerk ceiling fan was not manufactured by the estate of William S. Lee, but was rather a product of the Hunter Fan and Motor Company out of New York, doubly verifying the conclusions we drew from the ink stamp. The copy also tells us the audience for this ephemeron, Phrases like possible customers and clerks or assistants tell us that this was not circulated to the general public, but specifically to businesses. This again can seem like an insignificant part of the ephemeron, but there's actually a lot to discover. We can tell, for instance, that the estate of William S. Lee is an official agent for the company, as this ephemeron was not sent to the Essex Institute from Salem, but rather from New York. That means that this piece would have had to have been printed with Lee's name before it was sent. Estate of also indicates to us that William S. Lee had died and likely recently. It's unlikely that his descendants or partners taking over the business would have kept that name longer than a few years after his death. Again, a quick bit of research tells us that Lee did indeed die in 1906, just two years before this ephemeron was printed. Finally, the address provides a piece of information with which we can do many things, not least of which being geoparsing it for use in a map. So parallel to my processing work, I've also been experimenting with digitally mapping these ephemera to create novel ways for researchers to interact with them. Finally, we have the insertion. This obviously gives us the exact date of publication. It also tells us that in the end, all things considered, the Essex Institute did not want a twerk ceiling fan as the card is not filled out and was not returned to the estate of William S. Lee. This also tells us that these materials were collected and preserved by the Essex Institute. So we're just about finished with the first part of the presentation. Before we move on to some stories from our ephemera collections, let's talk briefly about the more practical uses of ephemera. So one of the things that can make ephemera so special is that they often depict buildings, interiors, or products that either no longer exist or no longer look as they did at a certain period. Like this photography studio from the Salem Willows. This means that advertising ephemera can be used for all kinds of restoration work, as contractors or historians are able to recreate how a building or interior may have looked in any given period. Perhaps more fun and exciting is the use of ephemera in media. On the right here, you'll see two examples of ephemera on TV, drawn from my own recent television watching. So up top, 
for those of you who watch the TV show Watchmen, on the left we have a broadside that features quite prominently in the show. As it turns out, it's actually based on real broadsides that were distributed to Black American soldiers in World War I to try to get them to defect the German side. And you can see an example of the real broadside to the right of the TV still. On the bottom, we have arguably one of the most famous pieces of American ephemera, the broadside from the Ford Theater on the night President Lincoln was assassinated. This broadside was reproduced, even using some, making some attempts to mimic the type use in the episode back there of The Twilight Zone. And I'll warn you now, if you start looking for ephemera in TV and film, you will never be able to stop, so proceed with caution. Finally, the more common use of ephemera in film is uh, much in the same, is much the same as its use in restoration work, so historical accuracy. Film and TV consultants can find literally hundreds of examples of what someone might have worn, what their home may have looked like, or what they would have seen on the shelves in their local dry goods store simply by picking up a contemporary trade catalog or other piece of advertising ephemera. Whereas extant clothes, accessories, or packaging can be exceedingly rare depending on how old they are. And yes, I am telling you this in the hopes that someone makes a film where this floral bedroom features prominently. So that wraps up the first part of my presentation. Next, we're gonna go more in depth into the micro histories we can draw from ephemera and why they are important to preserve. So wartime and business culture are deeply intertwined. In the most obvious sense, advertising often plays off patriotic sentiments featuring American flags, eagles, or imagery specific to the war at hand, such as cannons or symbols of the Union. But one of the most interesting narratives that can emerge from wartime or war-influenced advertising is the representation of physical disability. These narratives sometimes aren't even the focus of the broader ephemeron, as with this dental circular. Here, the highlighting of facial prosthetics both helps us to date this broadside to around or just after the Civil War era, and highlights that facial prosthetics were not the domain of doctors, but rather that of dentists. But more importantly, beyond the practical, the contemporary scholar can also read this as a representation of disability and difference. Some of the most interesting of these narratives come to light in prosthetics advertising. The Salem leg was an improved prosthetic invented by George Jewett of Salem in the 1860s. Jewett himself actually used a prosthetic leg and set out to create one that was more dynamic than the wooden legs that were popular at the time. It bears reminding that this advertisement would not exist if there were not for the prevalence of amputation during the Civil War. It's estimated that about 60,000 men underwent some kind of amputation, making it the most common medical procedure performed. Though we can always read wartime ephemera through the lens of military history, a closer look highlights the broader sociocultural value of these materials. So in the middle here, I drew out this part of the pamphlet to highlight this kind of ingenious advertising strategy put forward by Jewett. So as you can read here, the US government provided soldiers who had fought in the Civil War $75 every five years to purchase a new prosthetic. Jewett proposes that the Salem leg will outlast the five years and the soldiers can just pocket the money from the government. Now, not only do I always appreciate a good way to stick it to the man, this policy more generally gives us a sense of the quality of prosthetics at the time and what the experience of a returned soldier might be. But more importantly, the testimonials in prosthetics advertisements actually provide us with a wealth of self-representation of folks with disabilities. In the Salem Leg Circular, the testimonials are actually broken down by the type of amputation and detail the experiences of people with that particular disability using the Salem leg. Many of the testimonials list specific activities that the letter writer had been previously unable to do without this improved prosthetic, such as heavy farm work, horseback riding, or dancing. This again gives us an insight into the quality of assistive technologies that had been available, as well as just traces of these folks' lives. 
Though all the testimonials are valuable, the most remarkable are those from women. It is incredibly rare to have any representation of a woman with a physical disability at this moment in time, or if we're being honest, at most moments in time, including our own, let alone self-representation. During the 19th century, there was still a great deal of shame associated with having phys physical disability as a woman, which we can tell from the fact that all of the women offering testimonials remain anonymous when there are many named men in the pamphlet. Even this woman, who explicitly told Jewett he was free to use her name, still appears as lady in her testimonial. This censorship of her name, which we can read as a kind of shielding of her honor on the part of Jewett, further underlines the marginalization of these women. Perhaps my favorite testimonial, and perhaps the most radical, is Case W. So in her testimonial, Lady writes that she has walked with it prosthetic leg two miles on different occasions. If we consider upper class women in 1877, most of them are not going to be walking two miles on any occasion. This testimonial then can be read as a self-representation of a middle or working class woman who uses a prosthetic. Even in its brevity, this is a piece of history highly unlikely to have been preserved anywhere else. In the face of the cultural shame attached to disability in this period, to have direct testimonials from these women detailing their experience in their own words is an incredible resource. So keeping our previous discussion in mind, it bears underlining that ephemera are not neutral, nor is any advertising. They can often reveal broader ideologies, social norms, or conceptions of different groups. Here on the left, we have a comparison of female-directed and male-directed advertising from the same 1940s catalog, clearly both representing and reproducing stereotypes of gender roles. So we can read this catalog as a female-coded advertisement, though all the products are gender-neutral, such as batteries and lamps. All of the interior advertisements, except for one, are explicitly directed towards women, illustrated with images of domestic bliss as imagined by 1940s ad men, women in heterosexual relationships taking care of their children and home. The only advertisement directed at men can be seen here uh, at the bottom. It's pretty comical to the contemporary viewer. The woman is meant to recognize herself in the housewife and buy the home appliances, while the man is meant to recognize himself as this manly man, or perhaps the man strenuous, who fights off lions with his ever-ready flashlight. I mean, the jokes write themselves. In all seriousness, though, we can connect this catalog to broader histories of masculinity in the post-war era, or the inception of the women's liberation movement. Similarly, ephemera can also contain more explicit traces of social histories, such as this advertisement for Raymond's Refectory, owned by John Raymond, member of one of Salem's most famous Black families. This nota bene that you see on the bottom here is a remnant of the practice of gendered segregation in 19th century dining rooms. Usually, there would be two separate entrances and two separate dining rooms for men and women to eat their oysters and ice cream, hopefully not together. In all these cases, we see the way gendered social norms play out both textually and visually. But beyond female-directed advertising, ephemera can also offer us a look into the history of women's work. Traces of women's work in the 19th century are available to us in contemporary directories where working women's professions are listed alongside their names, or sometimes in personal papers that have been preserved either institutionally or by an individual. However, many of these materials have not been preserved and without looking in aggregate, it can be difficult to get a sense of what it was really like to be a woman at work or what some of these professions actually looked like in the day to day. Ephemera can fill in the gaps to a certain extent by providing both material evidence of women's work, things like trade cards from women-owned businesses, and depictions of women's work, like this broadside from the Salem Steam Laundry Company. In this way, we can trace the history of women's work in Essex County. 
One of the most interesting pieces here is the trade card for Dr. Brown and Company. A male physician and gynecologist, Dr. Brown spends most of the card talking about his expertise and that of the other male doctors. But then in passing on the bottom mentions that if they prefer, women can choose to see Dr. Alice Guilford, who will visit Salem on certain days. We can draw a great deal of information from this about both women's work and women's healthcare. So first, of course, this card functions as a material trace of a female doctor, actually the only one in the collection, including the more modern materials. We can also extrapolate from this that Salem likely didn't have a female doctor, since Dr. Guilford is coming up from Lynn weekly to see patients. It's also implied that women may have felt more comfortable with the female doctor, hence the specific mention and the use of bold type. So on its surface, this simply serves as a trace of women's attitude toward healthcare and bodily privacy. However, the plot, as they say, begins. So when I found this ephemeron, I decided to try to find Dr. Guilford in the Lynn directories to see where her practice was based. I was able to locate her in the 1885 directory and then in the 1886 directory, but then she disappeared and I wasn't able to find her in any subsequent volumes. So I did a bit of digging. And as it turns out, Dr. Alice Guilford was not just providing basic gynecological exams to the women of Essex County. She was, in fact, convicted of providing abortions to the women of the North Shore in 1886 and then again in 1887 after the death of one of her patients. In the end, she was sentenced to a total of six years in prison and her husband, who had assisted her, left the state. Now, there's so much to unpack here that it could honestly be its own presentation. So I will just wrap this up by underlining the fact that without this ephemeron, we would not have known that Dr. Guilford was coming to Salem as often as she was. And with the additional context provided by the newspaper articles, we also know that the services she was providing to the women of Salem were more diverse than was indicated on the card. This can help us to flesh out our understanding of women's health care and access to abortion in 19th century Massachusetts. All right, so that may have been a little heavy, so we're going to lighten things up with one of my favorite types of ephemera in the collection, the airing of grievances. They're often very petty, gossipy, and funny, and relay bizarre and often lurid crimes and incidents. Beyond that, however, they also show the role that ephemera played in public discourse, especially in the 19th century. It's interesting because in this period, advertising ephemera often didn't simply mimic or reflect the newspaper and correspondence record, but rather complemented them and actually had a specific and often unique role to play in public discourse. So let's take a look at what I mean. So here we have two different crimes. Starting on the right, we have an example of a 19th century con man. Um, as an aside, I just finished watching the TV show Dirty John, so I couldn't resist including this. Um, in essence, one Dr. McCormick, leaving to winter in sunnier climes, had left his physician's practice in the care of James O'Ready, the author of our circular. In our ephemeron, O'Ready details the deceptions of a Dr. J.T. Gallagher, who had falsely laid claim to Dr. McCormick's pra practice in his absence, telling townsfolk that McCormick had appointed him as the steward of the enterprise. But not only was J.T. Gallagher falsely identifying himself as Dr. McCormick's agent, it also seems he was falsely identifying himself as a doctor, while never, according to these testimonials, actually having attended medical school. Very scandalous. Now on the left, we have another notice of a crime and a reward for information from Frank Cousins, shop owner and Salem photographer extraordinaire. I've paired this broadside with an actual image of one of Cousins' store windows drawn from our collection of his photographs of Salem and beyond. If you're interested in seeing more, that collection is fully digitized and is available through the Digital Commonwealth. But beyond the ability to make meaningful connections with other materials from the Phillips Library, why do these two stories matter? So in both cases, uh, sorry, 
in both cases, I looked extensively through contemporary newspaper accounts and was unable to find any mention of either of these cases. So firstly, the fact that these men didn't feel the need to air these grievances in the newspaper shows that ephemera actually played a significant role in public business discourse, separate from that of periodicals or correspondence. But beyond that, it also means that these two pieces of ephemera are the only known extant traces of these events. If they hadn't been preserved, these stories would have been lost. Now, I couldn't present on the history of Salem without touching at least once on the occult. So here we have a few different examples of magnetic and electric healers who were at various points working in Salem. This includes the incredibly pervily named Dr. Handy Electric Physician. I think I'll be passing on the massage treatments. Uh, similarly to the materials we just looked at, stories of itinerant visitors and especially alternative or occult healers can be, can be underrepresented in other media. In most of these cases, I wasn't able to find any other information about any of these folks. But today I'm going to focus on the case of Timothy W. Lincoln, as it's one of my favorites of these materials. Uh, if you just look at that image, you can probably imagine why. So in 1896, Lincoln was traveling in Maine when he was struck by lightning during a large storm. After his accident, he claimed to be gifted with magnetic powers that would allow him to heal those he touched and traveled throughout Massachusetts giving demonstrations. Interestingly, he provided these services for free, which perhaps speaks to his conviction in his powers, as well as the broader cultural acceptance of them as legitimate at the time. This small advertisement circulated in Salem is the only known record of his visit to the city. Though Boston newspapers reported on his newly discovered powers, I was unable to find any newspaper record of his visit to Salem. By preserving this ephemeron, we can trace his journeys throughout Massachusetts, providing medical help, however dubious it may be. So we've looked at what ephemera are, the myriad things we can do with them, and how the micro histories they illuminate can inform our understandings of the past. As I conclude my talk, I want to finally focus on the collection of ephemera, first institutionally and then personally. So for some reason, many institutions, while valuing and showcasing their early ephemera collections, haven't actually been actively collecting contemporary ephemera, that is, up until this year. So I don't think I need to remind you all that 2020 has been a wild ride, but it does bear reminding that it's also been very much a year of ephemera. So from the signs hung in windows to thank frontline workers, to the protest signs carried by the masses of protesters in the wake of George Floyd's death, these ephemeral traces of our year are in many ways more indicative of our local community's experience than a more official book or newspaper account would be. As you see here on the left, we have a poster or broadside from Salem that will eventually make its way into our newly inaugurated COVID-19 Essex County ephemera collection. And yes, this is the moment in the talk where I solicit your donations of 2020 ephemera on behalf of the Phillips Library. At the end of the talk, I'll be putting up our contact information. If you have anything you'd like to donate or any questions, feel free to reach out. I also included these scrapbooks and traces of personal collecting from the Phillips Library to underscore the fact that institutional ephemera collecting is completely intertwined with personal collecting. Our representations of any given event or time period are only as diverse as the materials we collect. This is to say that institutions have an obligation to collect ephemera both actively and proactively in conversation and in coordination with a diverse range of community members. Ultimately, ephemera are pieces of the people's history, especially when traditional publishing continues to only represent a very narrow perspective. So on that note, I will end by with a look at my own ephemera collecting 
So by showing you these images, I want to emphasize, especially to folks watching who might not be directly involved with libraries or museums, how ephemera can preserve your own narratives and how its collection can be used as a tool of historical record making. So as an adult, I have moved towards more official collecting. I've been collecting ephemera, albeit unintentionally, since I was a kid. I was always saving stickers, brochures, notes from my friends, or interesting packaging. These tickets that you see here in the upper left-hand corner are from my large collection of ticket stubs and are a perfect example of how small narratives can be encapsulated in ephemera. For example, now I can relive in front of all of you the embarrassment of having gone to see Twilight at a Friday matinee showing back in 2008. It can be easy to write off personal ephemera as uninteresting or unimportant, or even in a more extreme case, as trash. But imagine having a similar collection of tickets or school notes from your grandmother or your great grandfather. I hope this peek into my personal collecting can underline the accessibility of ephemera. It's either cheap or usually often free. Uh, it's abundant and it's literally so easy to collect that a child could do it. I'm pretty sure the earliest tickets in my collection were from the Seattle Children's Theater from when I was maybe eight or nine years old. Collecting and preserving bits of printed matter that mark life events, media consumed, or trips taken can serve as a way for future generations to connect to our own personal narratives. And maybe someday even end up in a library collection and be used to broaden historians' understandings of our contemporary moment. Be it on a personal or institutional level, the collection and preservation of ephemera means the collection and preservation of hyperlocal, popular, and marginalized narratives. And that is time. Thank you all so much again for attending. It's really a dream come true to be able to share the work I've been doing and to share this you know, beautiful, bizarre collection with all of you. I'm going to send it back to Dan now, who will be taking your questions. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Hannah. That was amazing. Um, such a visual treat, all of it. Um, we do have time for a few questions, um, so please feel free to drop those in the questions box or in the chat window. Um, I really love the idea that we've got an infinite amount of stories here, and I know you just barely scratched the, sur the scratch that is on the surface. Um, and I also like to imagine that everybody attending today will look a lot more closely at for the appearance of ephemera in, in, TVs, in TV and movies, so that'll be fun. I'm, I'm hoping, I'll start you off with one of mine, and that is, like, you mentioned mapping work that you're doing when you're, when you're talking about the Turk ceiling fan ephemeron. Could you talk a little bit more about the, the mapping work that you're doing? Sure, so um, the mapping work that I uh, have been undertaking really began um, when we were all in quarantine, perhaps unsurprisingly. Uh, so I had taken a very introductory GIS class um, this past fall, and after that class, I got to thinking about my spreadsheet, my appendix to so the collection. Um, and with this wealth of addresses uh, associated with each ephemeron, I mean, just from this page alone, you can see that every single one of these has an, a Salem address on it. Um, it got me thinking that one of the ways people could interact with the collection would be to have it visually on a map. Um, so it's been a messy process. I've definitely been teaching myself a lot of this as I go through, um, but ultimately the goal is to have a data set um, that we can give out to people with all of the information included on the appendix spreadsheet uh, geoparsed, meaning that it will have identifying information on each one that when put into software that maps things uh, can be recognized and plotted onto a map of Salem. Um, one of the most interesting ways uh, I think I've been using this is uh, in creating different layers. So basically, if you're looking at the map, you're able to toggle between, say, only female owned businesses or only businesses from the 18th century. 
Um, and in this way, we give our researchers a new way to interact. Um, and if it ends up being a data set that we can actually dole out to people, um, there's a huge research potential and a huge potential for this to be included in um, various PhD work or uh, other professional work. Great. So uh, Byron has asked, um, along with saying that it was a very impressive presentation, which I agree with, um, he wants to know what is the strangest or most surprising piece of ephemeron you have come across in your work? Huh. That's a really good question. Um, I mean, the collection is really full of weird stuff. Um, some of the, uh, if we go back, some of these definitely, some of the um, occult healing power and uh, a lot of the patent medicine stuff is really bizarre. Um, not in the Essex County materials, but in the kind of broader advertising ephemera collection. Uh, we have a lot of uh, Mariani wine advertisements, um, which is actually a cocaine infused wine that was popular for a while in, at the end of the 19th century. Um, and they actually had a Pope be the spokesperson for it, which is maybe the best part. Um, other than that, I mean, there's a lot of surprising material types. So uh, one of my favorite items that didn't get included is um, a felt hat brush that is shaped right. like a little bowler hat and advertises on the strap um, a milliner in Salem. But I mean, honestly, each and every piece is kind of bizarre and unique and funny in its own way. There was the asbestos sample that um, caused a little bit of a kerfluffle when you came across it, I remember. Um, yeah, we we found a piece of, of, of asbestos. Um, it was a sample that was mailed out with a circular, uh, and it said something along the lines of, you know, just try to light me on fire. And so, you know, the consumer was meant to go home and try to light it on fire and be like, wow, this is definitely what I'm going to use as my siding. Um, but obviously now uh, we can't really handle asbestos safely. Um, we ended up vacuum sealing it actually so that we can still provide researcher access but that it isn't hazardous to anyone's health yeah rita uh asks what the best way is to preserve or catalog a personal collection of ephemera maybe you can provide a little bit of advice sure so um i mean that's something that i kind of struggle with myself because you know i'm an early career librarian. I'm not, you know, making the big bucks. So obviously you have these, you know, really fancy, uh, you know, acid free boxes and archival grade stuff that you can get. Um, but one of the easiest ways is actually just sheet protectors like you would get for a binder. Um, and you can get ones that are specifically acid free and archival grade. Um, and you can get a big, huge thing of them um, on the internet for pretty cheap. Um, and basically just using that to sleeve each piece of ephemera. That's what I've been doing. Um, and then just sticking them in a file folder in a file cabinet. Um, that's how I keep my personal collection uh, preserved. Um, as far as cataloging, that's kind of personal preference. Um, I have long ago started trying to catalog my ephemera collection. Um, using just uh, Google Sheets, so basically Excel. Um, and I found that that's actually, you know, a pretty handy way to do it. I mimicked the appendix that I created for this collection um, and then just in included the information for each header um, for my own personal collection. Right, that makes it very easy to sort and find what you're looking for in your collection. Yeah. That control F or command F function. <laughs> right. <So. laughs> um, Norbert wants to know if um, he refers to docents, but he says, will we be able to conduct research with the ephemera collection? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I did not put in 18 months of work, so this could languish <laughs> more. Uh, I really hope that people get excited. Um, that's one of the reasons we're actually having this talk. Um, is to get you all interested and in, into the Phillips Library. 
Um, so we're still working on getting the finding aid up, but the collection is totally accessible. So um, again, back to this slide. If you're interested at all, um, you can email us at research at PEM.org and uh, get in touch with the reference team. Um, and if you just list, you know, kind of broad business sector interests, we can direct you to the materials. Um, and that the finding aid and the collection will soon, hopefully, be going online. Um, and then you will have full access to the finding aid and to the appendix. Elizabeth is uh, curious to know if you are scanning every piece as you catalog them. And I'll actually just step in here briefly just to suggest to Elizabeth that she follow our social media account, particularly Instagram at PEM Library, because Hannah is one of the one of the women that runs that account, and she does an amazing job of including ephemera um, in our feed. So, but I'll let yeah. you answer the question about scanning what your what your catalog. That's true. Is. I think. Ephemera are like the only thing that I post. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I mean, I haven't been scanning everything. Um, a lot of these materials, um, like a lot of the materials you saw in the presentation today are going to be things like trade cards that are a little more one dimensional and easy to scan. But a lot of the items in the collection are actually, you know, maybe big oversized trade catalogs, um, multi page items. And with that, it's just not feasible. Like, you know, we want to center research or access, but, you know, we don't want it to be like, uh, let's do this and then wait, you know, five years for the collection to be fully digitized. Um, but I do know that these materials uh, are definitely on our list in terms of digis digitization um, because they are so beautiful and visual. Um, if you're interested, uh, I know a lot of other institutions have um, digitized their materials. Uh, so I know like American Antiquarian and the Library Company of Philadelphia, um, both of them have very robust ephemera collections. And um, a lot of, you know, it's that same kind of thing where it might be the same ephemeron, but just with a different stamp on it, different um, address. So not now, not all of it at least, uh, but hopefully in the future we can get all of it online. Very quickly, because we've got about a minute left. Um, um, Isla asks about how we acquired these pieces of collection and were they donations gathered by past librarians and archivists? Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure, so Even very though, quickly, um, we, don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, some of them have provenance information written on them. Um, so we know like some pieces were gifts, some pieces were uh, purchased. Um, one of the more interesting narratives is um, we have Charles Prescott Whipple. He collected a bunch of them. Um, and Harry Endicott Weber, those are like the two big early collectors as far as the collection goes. Um, but again, we don't have any documentation, so we're not clear, you know, when the collection started, how they kind of came to put it all together, um, if it was just someone's passion project. Um, so yeah, I wish I could say more, but unfortunately, we just don't really know. And we'll continue, we'll continue collecting. So um, thank you so much, Hannah, for this great talk, and thanks to Catherine, Bethany, Mark, and to everybody in attendance for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and I think as much as Hannah does in um, talking about ephemera. Um, we hope to see you at PEM and at the Phillips Library very soon. And as I mentioned, follow us on at PEM Library to see more ephemera coming out. And um, thanks for joining us, and have a great evening. Thanks, guys.